Okay, and now we'll just have a few second delay while Facebook streams us over as we always uh -huh. do. <laughs> this is where we have our smiling Facebook ready faces. <laughs> I'm ready. Yay, we're so excited to talk to everybody. I know, it's so fun. And we are live. Welcome, mighty mystery fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and I am thrilled to be here today with Vanessa Lilly, whose red-hot new book, For the Best, is out today. Vanessa, welcome. Tell us about your book. Thank you so much for having me. This is fantastic. Um, so this is my second thriller. It just came out today. It's called For the Best. And it's the story of a woman who kind of has everything, perfect life, CEO job. The problem is she has a drinking problem. And one night she goes out, has too much to drink, gets blackout drunk. The next day she wakes up, there's a cop at her door with her wallet in an evidence bag. And she's now the only suspect in a murder. Oh my gosh. Well, I know I was hooked in from the very first page because she's struggling to find out what she can remember. It's all coming back to her slowly. Vanessa, what was the inspiration behind this book? Why did you want to tell the story? Why now? Well, it started with actually uh, back at the Women's March in Washington. Um, there's this pretty famous now photo of a woman who's an activist named Angela Peoples. Um, and she's a, a Black woman. She's standing there with her sign. There are three white women behind her taking selfies with the pink hats and on her sign it says you know don't forget white women voted for Trump and when I saw that sign I kind of even though there was the joy of the march I did sit with it for us for a while actually and just think okay so that's true why so I started to just kind of explore white female privilege and I was thinking through and not just from a finger pointing perspective, but from my own privilege, right? And from my um, things I take for granted, things I expect, um, maybe I, the disregard of people of color or their problems at different times. Um, there's certainly been bad moments in my own life. And so I wanted to create a thriller, which is my favorite kind of book that explores that, particularly because th especially domestic thrillers, there's usually a white woman at the center of it. I mean, thankfully now there are more, um, women of color publishing in thrillers, but it is a very white space and even a white female space um, in this domestic thriller area. And so it seemed perfect for me to take that kind of usual trope of a woman maybe solving a crime, but then push and think about well, what, what privileges does she expect and what does she um, you know, think should happen versus a reality that she is pretty far from through most of it. And then the other piece that I love about it is um, that there's a vlog. So it's a video blog, which are pretty popular online right now. And um, she uses this vlog like a true crime to step through what's happened, to unravel the mystery herself and film it. And so interspersed in those chap the chapters of her are uh, transcripts of the vlog. And so that was really fun because I think we're all just obsessed with true crime right now. And so I loved writing those chapters um, because it's just such a fun kind of exciting moment um, in true crime. First of all, there's so much that you just said that I really, I cannot wait to dive into because you just gave me so much, so much <laughs> juicy, juicy, important waiting weighty, fascinating material to work with. And I want to, I want to dissect it piece by piece. So um, first of all, why do you, I totally agree. True crime is having a moment between the podcasts, between the documentaries, between the books. Why do you think that is? And why is it that we as women, because I'm one of them, I'm a true crime junkie. Why are we so fascinated? Why does this, why do we have to know? I think for me, it's, um, kind of an exploration of people at their worst because it's or most terrifying moments it's a lot of the reason why I love thrillers is it's probably about the worst time in a person's life is around when the thriller book is written and when there's a true crime documentary on you're almost guaranteed it's the most intense emotional probably terrible thing that's ever happened to this person and true crime now has been able to go from like law and order which I love obviously but merging it with all of the incredible storytelling capabilities we have right now, from podcasts to just incredible documentary series, um, and all the streaming services uh, can open up so you can almost watch anything anywhere. And so I think it's 
a combination of great storytelling right now with our kind of ongoing fascination with, you know, bad things that happen. And that probably goes way back to like the cavemen gathering around the fire. I mean, I think we've always been, you know, obsessed with stories, you know, that scare us a little bit. Oh my God. I love that. I love that. And I totally agree. Um, I want to welcome all of our friends on Facebook. I'm going to be monitoring your comments right over here. So welcome friends. Tell us um, where you're listening from today. I'm always fascinated where people are logging on from because that's the one, the one bright spot in this pandemic is that we have gone global. So we have people listening from all, all over. Donna, welcome is saying this book sounds like a great way to reach more people. Donna Shaw, thank you. I totally agree. And that actually is a perfect segue. So Donna, thank you for mentioning that. Thank you for saying that. I totally agree. Um, I think it was a great segue for what I want to get into next, which is, Vanessa, you're addressing something that I am wrestling with right now. I think um, a lot of white women are wrestling with right now. So first of all, I want to thank you for your courage for bringing this out, um, for addressing white female privilege. Um, and I think all of us are or should be wrestling with that and having this long overdue, much belated reckoning and awakening. Um, and that's something that I'm working through right now is, you know, and, and continue to work through how, you know, what is my privilege? What do I take for granted? And how can I be a good white ally um, for women of color and black women? Um, and so first of all, I just want to acknowledge your courage and thank you for doing that. And, um, and what, and we're getting some hearts up from the audience. Thank you. Um, so tell us about how you as a white wo woman dove into that here. So the, I think the first place I looked was a mirror. I really did not want to write this from a place of telling white women how to be accusing white women. I really wanted to think about the own things in my life, the own mistakes I've made. Um, and there've been plenty and they're ongoing too. I think you're talking about being a white ally. I think one of the most important things about it is that it is a lifetime journey. It is never a destination. We will never get there. You just have to constantly be working at it. And so I often just thought about things I'd done, behaviors I had, um, ways I had perceived things. And there's nothing like verbatim from my life, but there are emotions in there that I was able to translate to the character. And, you know, in some cases took them a couple steps further, but to me, not that much further. And, you know, we, as a society, it's been constructed to, to protect whiteness, to protect white land, white power, white money, all, I mean, that's just the history of our country. And so I wanted to just think about the systems like the police or a job. I mean, you know, the kind of, oh, she was just having fun last night. She got drunk. Like, does that happen to every woman? No, it usually will just happen to white women. You know, that a woman of color doesn't, usually cannot act like that in an office environment with having a much more severe, you know, punishment. Things mm -hmm. like that, that I just sort of took experiences maybe working in, in the business place and tried to bring them into my main character, Jules, um, into her experience. And then a big piece of this is her relationship with her father. And to me, you know, privilege isn't something you're born with. I mean, you are born with it, but it's, it's a learned behavior. And it's uh, the way that you see the world and the way the world was built for you. And so I very much wanted to dive into a pretty dark and complicated father in this because to me the behaviors we often learn can be handed down they can be observed from our communities from our families our friends and so I loved exploring ways in which her kind of toxic family and father relationship could translate into her present white privilege and what she expects. Oh, I love that you're dealing with this because you're I think you're absolutely right it is learn. Enti privilege is what you're born with and entitlement is what you're learn what you learn yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. And um and 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 I love that you're you're dealing with this and wrestling with this. Um because I'm also wondering you know and what you said about sparking this. Um you know I I live in a I live in a liberal bubble. I fully own that. I live in the liberal bubble of the you know the the, the state of Boston <laughs> which of course is the commonwealth of Massachusetts but I live in this and I choose it choose to, and I love it. Um, but I see these statistics that 40% of white women voted for Trump. And I ask myself how, um, because I personally could not vote for a misogynist. Um, and, and it's antithetical to everything that I believe in. And yet I am, I, and I don't, I feel like I don't know anybody 
um, who did, but I must. So it's something that I'm trying to figure out as well. So you're just dealing with so many timely, timeless and pressing issues. Um, so I absolutely love that you are bringing such meat to the table in the frame of a thriller. So well, thank you. I say, oh, of course, that's very generous. Thank you. I, thrillers to me are the perfect place to really push buttons. I actually was just working on an article for Crime Breeds about this and talking to a couple of different authors about how good crime fiction is political. And it's not necessarily about a political party, but it's about these core issues. Um, so uh, one writer I chatted with, um, Rachel Halsell Hall, she has a, a book coming out shortly and now she's gone. You know, she dealt with domestic violence and different ways in which the system can fail women and what repercussions that have on your family. I mean, and particularly with the lens of, uh, from a black woman in that perspective that's political and it should be and looking at a system is political and it's important another writer um lane fargo who has another book coming out they never learn she was telling me that that book which is about a professor who's a serial killer of very bad men um wrote it in the heat and anger of the kavanaugh hearings so i just love that you can connect what's happening in the world, but you can still make it a complete page turner, but you can um, infuse it with things that you are grappling with. And it's a great way to do it, I think, in a thriller. It just is perfect for it. Absolutely, and it makes it, I love that you're dealing, that you are doing this. Um, I wanna say welcome to Wendy Walker. She says, hello, this is oh. such an important issue. Wendy, hi, I think we're having you on next week. Um, and I can't wait to host you and shine a mighty, shining, shine yeah. my mighty, my, my mighty magnifying glass on you and get into your fabulous upcoming book. Yes. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And you're, and I totally agree. This is such an important issue. Um, and, and I love that you, that you use this as a way to, to speak truth to power and to call this stuff out and to, and to drag it out into the light. How long did it take you to write this book? Um, well, I wrote a first draft and it, this book was my second book. So it was under a contract, which is a whole new experience for me. <laughs> um, but I wrote it in about six months, but the revision was extensive. I mean, I, I revised almost the entire thing. And so, so you might think, oh, well, you already wrote one book. The second one's going to be easy. It was not true. It was really tough, but I loved the final product and it was, you know, totally worth it. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I'm six years into book number two and still not done. So I hear you on book oh, number two, the trial and tribulations of numero dos. Um, yes. So wait, it took you six months to write it and revise it or six months to write it and then you revised it? Six months to write it. And then I actually only had six weeks to revise it. So I really didn't do laundry. We ate out every night. I was writing in the car, revising in the car. I mean, it was just nonstop. But sometimes when you have a really big challenge like that, it just fo focused me in such a way that it was scary if I like stopped and thought about it. But if I just got in there and did the work, it was come, it came together. You know, it's like Anne Lamott says, bird by bird, like little bit by little bit. And that's really how, you know, wars are won. Just a little victories every day. So I truly, I mean, I cut like 60,000 words. I had to delete a point of view. I had to add all of the um, video vlog chapters. Those were all during revision. So there was a ton of work to do, but it's worth it because you just want to tell the best story. And when you get great input, you just, for me, I just go for it and almost always take all of it because, you know, writing can be a collaboration and, you know, and it's, wonderful to have these smart people who know what they're doing kind of give you ideas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Wendy saying she loves this conversation. Wendy, thank you so much. I'm loving this conversation too. Um, and, and yeah, and you know what I, I think, and we have, I just want to say we have so many um, dedicated writers and readers and aspiring writers, aspiring authors here in the audience. So we love to delve into craft. So this six month writing, six week revision is, is our jam. We love these details. Tell us about the cover and the title. Was this, did the, did the, let's start with the title. Did it come to you as a lightning bolt of brilliance? Was it number 101? How did that happen? It was, it was probably when I'm writing a book, I'll have four or five working titles just at the top, you know, as I'm doing different places, just, I'm like, oh, that could be good. And then that for the best to me, just spoke to the theme of why do you expect something to work out for the best? It's because the system is rigged in your favor. So I just sort of felt like it, you know, hit home that. Um, and there's also something a little creepy about for the best. It's a, it's to me, it's just a, 
a little insidious, just a little, there's something in it. Um, so my editor actually loved it right away. So that was nice because Little Voice is my debut. I think that was like the sixth title. So <laughs> we got all that out on the first one, but this one was easy. And the cover is interesting. Um, so I love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's so good. I have the same designer for Little Voices, um, also did for the best. And I sent her some ideas of book covers I liked, which, and she actually sent this back almost right away, this version. And I loved it so much, except for there was no pool in my book. So, and like, I do not like to read a book and the cover not match. And it's not her fault. How would she know that? Right. Um, but so I was like, you know, I was in revisions, as I stated, there were a lot of revisions. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to add a pool. So I added a pool that ended up kind of being a metaphor for the family and then putting on these airs and pretensions within their neighborhood. Um, and then I got to keep the cover that I love. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love this story. I'm kind of creepily peeking out, hello, behind it. But um, everything, I want everyone to just see how gorgeous it is because you can really see, you know, this figure of this woman, the wine glass, because an issue that you addressed is yeah. her chronic over drinking, her drinking issue. Um, you know, this big, beautiful, you know, sort of infinity pool. So you're addressing issues of, you know, of wealth and, and privilege. So I just absolutely love it. Tell us about some of the titles that ended up on the cutting room floor. You said this was one of four or five. What were, were any that ended up on the cutting room floor that you, you still kind of, the one that got away, you miss it, you yearn for it? No, there wasn't. And I, because I think I kind of, um, I'll do sort of easy titles like um, you know, when she was away or when she, you know, just kind of softer, like it could kind of go with a lot of things, but this one to me was just very strong and it just stood out. I, sometimes I think when I think about titles, if I get nervous about it, it's a good sign. It means there's something in it that's kind of intriguing. That's the same with plot points. When um, the twists at the end of both of these books, when I figured them out, I felt so uncomfortable and anxious. And for me, that's a sign that I'm like going in the right direction because I'm kind of scared. <laughs> oh my gosh, you scare yourself. I love it. Um, Carol Orange, welcome. She says, great cover. Carol, we totally agree. Thank you so much. Um, and again, I just want to invite everyone watching. This is your time with Vanessa. So if you've got questions, just put them right in the chat, in the, in the comments. I'll get them right over to her. This is your time. This is your access to her. You know how we do it here on Mighty Mysteries. It's all out up for grabs. So feel free to ask anything you're wondering about craft, writing, this book, this process, anything at all. Um, I'll get those questions right over to Vanessa while you're while you're thinking of them, I'll go ahead and, and keep plying her with my with my own, but please do. This is a this is a conversation. That's what we love here, that we're a community. So I want to invite everyone um, to go ahead and do that. So Vanessa, I have to share some of your incredible words of praise that you have earned. Um, Wendy Walker, who's joining us today, says, as a woman tries to clear her name of a murder charge using an investigative blog, she unearths secrets that hit close to home. The resolution is emotionally complex and devoid of sneaky tricks and tropes. For the best is intelligent and wholly original. It is a rare book that makes you race to the end, but then stop in your tracks and just say, whoa. Um, rave review from nice. the amazing Wendy, you, Wendy Walker here. Um, Kimberly Bell raves, Lily follows up her smashing debut with another winner, this time exploring just how far a person will go to keep old secrets buried. For the best is dark and gritty, starring a host of damaged characters who blur the line between what's true and what's not, a slow burn moody mystery that will keep you on your toes. From the amazing Kimberly Bell, who's also been on this show. Um, yeah, I love have, her, she's so great. Love and her. I, oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and the thing about, so like darker, gritty characters, I just, as a, as a thriller reader, um, I, I love unpeeling the layers, you know, mm -hmm. like the, if anyone seems all good or all bad, it's just boring. I mean, yeah. And so I love to, you know, almost pull between you kind of like them, but you kind of don't, which I think you feel that with my main character. I mean, it's a hard line to walk, um, but I do think it's so interesting to kind of push a reader's buttons. Like I like it when authors do that to me as a reader, for sure, to just kind of push some buttons and just kind of see what a reader thinks. Absolutely. Um, Wendy wants to know, did you have to fight for the ending? Any dissenters on your team? Great question, Wendy. Yeah, the, the ending is a little different than probably a lot of people were expecting. Um, but the, yeah, but, but my, right, my, um, my editor 
liked it. And um, <laughs> I think I was also had the benefit of having so many extensive revisions to do <laughs> that if like, they probably were just so glad that I got it done that I was going to be able to have my crazy ending. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, just give her what she wants. She did That's all right. If you can write it and get it in on time, you can have your crazy ending. But I was raised on days of our lives. I mean, I love, you know, like really, I mean, if you've sat through 300 pages, I'm going to do the best to like give you something shocking and a little over the top. I mean, I, I, I'd rather go big than go under, you know? <laughs> go, you exactly. Okay. So Vanessa lives by go big or go home. And when it right. comes to endings, we love that. Um, and clearly it's working for you. Crime reads, calling it a must read for September, pop sugar, a must read for the summer. Um, so clearly what you're doing is working. Um, so for those of us in the audience who are all about that craft, what do you think the secret is to writing a book that keeps the pages flying, that keeps the reader up at night saying just one more chapter? Uh, for me, it was a really great understanding of structure. So my favorite craft book um, right now is uh, Save the Cat Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody. I just, it really helped me get my arms around craft and the um, way in which you build a structure. Uh, because a lot of times when something feels slow, I think it's a result of just not having the beats and the turning points in all the right places. And so I think, you know, you it's not exactly a prescription, like it's, you know, it's not a paint by numbers, but I mean, there's some certain points that you should be hitting things. And as a reader, you'll feel it. If something isn't quite happening, it's like, it's because, you know, the midpoint is longer or shorter or, so I think to really focus on structure can help build the kind of page turning um, that people want. Ooh, interesting. So I always ask that question because we like to know the secrets here on the my mystery. <laughs> um, and that's the first time I heard the answer that structure is the secret to suspense to, you know, to keeping that, to keeping those pages flying. So thank you for that. Very interesting. Um, Leah Kona was on. She also said she loved um, Save the Cat. I haven't read it, but now I think I might have to. Um, but I love the answer of structure. Um, <laughs> Kara was saying, I'm such a tease, or sorry, Donna is saying, I'm such a tease for, 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 for flashing the ending. Donna, you got to get this book. We have a special <laughs> partnership with bookshop.org, which of course supports independent bookstores. Yes. Um, and we are linking to that in the comments. Thank you. Um, Wendy, Wendy says she watched GH as well. Um, and that she's going to use this tactic for next time as well. Awesome. We love that. I think I'm going to have to use that, that, that tactic. Exactly. This, this big ending. <laughs> just got to go big. <laughs> you just got to go big. Yeah. Um, so yeah, exactly. Got, and not be afraid to lean into that. Um, uh, yeah, definitely. And it just, I don't know, like, it's pretty rare for me as a reader, if an ending, as long as you know, it's like got to all line up, right? I mean, acknowledging that. I never read an end and think, you know, that was just way too exciting. <laughs> I never think that, you know, so I, so that I like to try to, yeah, you just like, I try to push myself and there's actually um, in some craft classes, they'll do this, that if you get stuck or even if you're not stuck, even if it's an important moment, like a midpoint or an opening or the end to sit down and write 10 or 15 things that could happen and even try to make them build and build and build on each other and just see how far you can take it. Because sometimes we maybe take the easy road to just like get through the chapter. It's like, okay, well, they're just gonna sit at this coffee table and talk and then we'll be, you know what I mean? So yeah. you can challenge yourself and be like, okay, no, actually what if someone's at the door? Actually, no, what if the person at the door has a gun? What if they have their child? Like you can just, and you, you're not gonna do, you don't wanna be at an 11 all the time. <laughs> like that would be a lot, but there might be moments when you're working that you can push a scene a little bit further just to have, as you were saying, that hook or that twist that really keeps you flipping the pages. I love that. I love that. I'm remembering the SNL um, take on the Kavanaugh hearing. Kavanaugh hearing where he says, I come in at a 15 and I come in at 11 and take it right up to a 15. Can't always do that. Right. Um, when he's saying structures everything with a thriller, I agree. This is so fascinating. Thank you, ladies. This is well, Wendy's so good at structure. I mean, her books are master classes, so that means a lot. She's one of the absolute best writers right now, for sure, writing. She's she's always coming out swinging. I love it. I love all oh. of her books. Oh my gosh. Well, now I'm even more excited to have Wendy on next she's week. It's going to be great. Yay. Waters is saying that she loves this idea 
um, of a choose your own adventure. Waters, right? What a cool, what a cool way to think about things. I have never thought of writing that way. So that is fascinating to me. I learned so much doing these interviews. This is fantastic. Yeah. Um, Vanessa, let's talk about um, what your writing process is like. Does it come easily to you? Do you do you rise with the sun? Do you just you know have your coffee and sit at your desk as the birds chirp outside and, and they pour, pour out? Or are you sort of like Hemingway, you know, clawing your way through a desert? for every word. Yeah, it's, I think it varies day to day and having some flexibility is good. Um, the, for me, my big lesson is, so by the time my debut Little Voices was published, I've been trying to be published for about 13 years. So it had been a journey. And within the about first 10 years, it was, um, I wrote two books over five years which is, you know, not a great ratio for like a thriller writer. Like you kind of need to be turning them out about every year, year and a half. So when I sat down for Little Voices, I said, all right, I'm going to actually enter National Novel Writing Month, which is coming up, yeah. um, which is a great opportunity. And I decided to just try the fast draft method, which is the opposite of what I have been doing. And I also outlined a lot more and that really worked well for me. So that is my kind of newer process with Little Voices. I did the same thing. I wrote it during Nano. I mean, it was terrible. But then you revise maybe for another year. You know, if you write the thing in one or two months, you've got plenty of time to revise. <laughs> and then the same for for the best. For the best, I wrote it a little bit slower because I was also promoting my debut at the time. Um, but you know, by about six months, I'd written several drafts, and then another six weeks. So for me, it is better to push myself to be a little faster. Mm -hmm. um, because as uh, I think Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic. Big Magic okay. says, yep. um, done is better than great. Yes, exactly. That's so important. And for those of, for our friends who are not familiar with Nano Remo, it is National um, Novel Writing Month. It's in November. And so everyone, if you've ever dreamed of writing a book, there's a ton of support on social media and, and Twitter, hashtag Nano Remo. And you basically try to write the draft of a novel or the most of a novel in 30 days. And so you just have this incredible sense of support because there's so many people around the entire world who every day are trying to get those words down, trying to meet that, that word count. Um, so if anyone, so check it out. They even have a website, nanoremo.com. And uh, again, it's National Novel Writing Month and it's coming up in November. So for those of us who are not familiar with it, this and who have dreamed of writing a book, this could be your chance. Absolutely. It's a, and it's such a fun event. Like if you follow the hashtag on social media and things, they have writing sprints where you just sit down and you write for say 20 minutes with a bunch of people on Twitter with you. And it, and you'll be amazed if you write for 20 minutes or even 10, 15 minutes, several times in a row, pretty soon you've got more pages than you had expected. So there are a lot of good ways to like trick you into getting your word count for the day. Yay. And it's so cool. I think it is so encouraging for people who may be dreaming of writing that book to know that you actually wrote your first book in this process. I sure so did. it can happen and you can Absolutely. get all of this incredible praise and get published. It can happen. So it's so great to see a success story. Um, and, and also thank you for sharing that it took you 13 years to get to that point. So inspiring, giving all of us life, giving all of us hope. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions, um, Carol is saying writing is revision, revision, revision. Totally agree, Carol. Wendy is saying thank you, Wendy, of course. Um, Vanessa, what, what's your weirdest writing ritual? Do you have, tell us your weird. Mm, something, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of a weird person, so this should, Ooh, good. This should, this should come pretty naturally. Um, so the, this is weird in a craft way, but this is, I am a restless writer. So I will be in Word for a week or two, and then I'll, it'll drive me crazy and I'll stop and I'll open up Scrivener. Yes. And I'll put everything into Scrivener and then I'll work that way for a week or two. Then I'll want to open an Excel document and chart everything. I, there, and I think that happens because there's something not working. Hmm. So every few weeks, something's not working. And if it's structure, I'm probably going to Scrivener. If the um, prose is a little flat, I'm probably going to Word. Um, sometimes I'll even print it out um, and look at the structure by just laying everything out in different acts. So I, I think, I don't know if that's weird, weird, but it's definitely strange to always be open to attacking your work in a different way. And 
just being flexible about it. Like I have no certain way of doing things and what worked great one day inevitably will not work great the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I do that too. I've got PowerPoints. I've got Excels. I've got beautiful minds, like giant post-its yeah. all over my office. Uh, I do it. I do it all. And I, and I work in Scrivener and Word as well. So I think it, I love having all these tools in our arsenals and, and seeing what works and staying open to what works and staying flexible mentally. Yeah. Right. So are you a plotter or a pantser? Well, I'm a reformed you know, pants are, I, I used to write by the seat of my pants in those 10 years and I really enjoyed it. But oftentimes when you love your character so much, you could just have them sitting around having dinner and talking for like four chapters because you are just, you love them and you're enamored with them, but that doesn't really make a good story most likely. So, um, I do outline pretty seriously now. And part of it is the structure part. And then also it's just I feel kind of, when I'm writing, I feel uncomfortable if I don't have my arms around a story. It's just this like anxiousness that I do not like. And so the faster I can at least get a sense of the story, kind of the better for me. And I find that to do that really plotting, you know, is what helps. That said, I love um, changing direction all the time. I mean, truly things happen all the time while I'm writing. I'll pop in scenes. I have no idea something was happening or twist what happened. So I'm like open to it but I do have to kind of keep my eyes on the road. Oh, I love that. I love the metaphor of keeping your eyes on the road. That's, that is so on point. Uh, we have our next question from the audience. Waters would like to know, I know you had first readers who really challenged you. How did you choose them and how did you get them to be open and honest in their critiques? Oh my God, I love this question because this is so important. We need to be able to provide loving yet honest feedback and people who can do it. Tell us, tell us, tell us your secrets, Vanessa. So with For the Best, that editorial process was with my editor who had acquired my book. So it was sort of like a boss, right? So like, it wasn't like you're getting feedback from a coworker. It was like, my boss was telling me what to do. So that was easy in that I just did what I was told. Though that isn't every case, but with Little Voices, it was, I think more what you're talking about, which is I had different critique partners through the process. You know, you'd get 50 pages done and then you'd sort of be like, oh, this is pretty good. Like, I want to see what someone thinks. I, that's important. And you, sh and I think we, it's great to do that, but I think it's almost like, a therapist or a girlfriend or boyfriend, like it's a special relationship, a critique partner, and they can break your heart if you're not careful. Like I had a couple of people read little voices at different points and they just didn't like it. And that's fine. But to be at a place where you are completely open to like a harsh criticism, especially if you know you haven't been published before or it's early in the drafting process. So everything is still kind of new. Um, one way I think to get around that is to be just super clear about what you want and be honest with yourself about mm -hmm. like, be true. Like, okay, if someone comes back to me and blasts this, I'm going to be really upset and I won't be able to write for three weeks. Like if you need to be able to be really honest about what you need and know yourself. And it's like, of course we always should be like, oh, you can say whatever you want. But like, is that really true? Because what happens is when you get feedback that you either didn't ask for or is much harsher or different than you needed, I, for me, it blocks me completely. Wow. And I get almost scared to work on it and I'm so humiliated or defeated. And that's a lot of power to give a person to be able wow. to stop you from being creative. So definitely no, like going in, maybe just exchange maybe 20 pages. I wouldn't just send somebody my whole book. Um, you know, kind of exchange together. If you can have, you know, a quick chat or email conversation about kind of what you need, like maybe it's just this round, I'd rather be just kind of more, what did you like about it? And then later I'll delve more into what to change. Like, it's okay to just need some positive feedback and some encouragement. I mean, especially if you're in the early stages of the draft, I mean, nothing's really that good till, in my opinion, much, much later. You just need to be like, oh, that's a cool character. And ooh, I love that plot twist. And ooh, the setting is really vivid here. Like, it's okay to just need a little bit of reassurance so that you feel like you're on the right path. And then maybe once you've gotten the whole thing written and you're just a little more solid in it, Maybe then if you've built up a great relationship with someone or at least a trusted relationship, then you can be like, all right, here's my whole book. But to just do that with like a random person you met on Twitter, I mean, for me, it, it just was really hard. I, I needed to take time, get to know the person, and then also be honest with myself about what I needed in that moment 
on my on my critique. Yes. And I feel like you actually just described good communication in any partnership, whether it's a friendship, whether it's yeah. a marriage. I mean, I, I feel like I've learned this, you know, in all of my best relationships, again, friendships and my marriage, where I've learned to ask for what I want and to say, so and when someone's giving me something else to say, oh, actually, that isn't what I was asking you for. This is what I was asking you yes. for. And to yeah. have courage to say, nope, that doesn't serve me, you know, yeah. and it's so mm-hmm. empowering and freeing and liberating. And also you get what you need. <laughs> Yes. And you protect yourself a little bit too, which is really important. I mean, the creative muse, the person who's helping us get through, I mean, to me, she is a little skittish and when she's discouraged, she really doesn't like to come out. So, you know, sometimes you just got to work without her, but I do think that there's ways that you can try to protect her and definitely a harsh critique can be really tough. Exactly. My muse is skittish. And also she likes a lot of naps. I mean, I got to lure her out, you know, with chocolate and foot massage. Mine likes, she likes starbursts and sunflower seeds, which is so gross, but you know what? You just do what you got to do. You do what you got to do to keep her happy. Cause if she's happy, you're happy. <laughs> Cause then she's going to help you rate. So it okay. all works out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Vanessa Lilly is dropping pearls of wisdom for writing and life relationships with muses, marriages, uh, partners, critique partners. All This is so juicy and fantastic. I'm just absolutely loving this interview. Um, I, I feel like we've been chatting for a second, but I see we're almost out of time. So it's time for us to enter the lightning round. Okay. Um, Vanessa, are you ready? I am. Morning or afternoon writer? Mm, morning. What are you currently reading? I'm about to start when no one is watching by Alyssa Cole. Excellent. Um, who, what is, who is one writer, dead or alive, that you would kill to meet? Um, I mean, I kind of would love to hang out with Anne Rice. Yeah. <laughs> I loved her books growing up and she just seems like a fascinating person. And if I could like go to her mansion back when she lived in New Orleans and like have a fabulous party. Like that would be pretty sweet. It's sure. It, it, it absolutely, it absolutely would. Oh yeah. One more question from the audience. I'm going to get, make sure because I always want to make sure everyone gets what they need. Yeah. Um, so I, water is the same. So I saw you were giving away Austin tarot cards. Does that mean that there is a, um, a spiritual mystic vibe in this book? Ooh. Ooh, that's great. Yeah. I'm doing a giveaway for if, if whenever someone posts a review of my book, they're going to get an entry to win this cool box of goodies. And one of them are Jane Austen tarot cards. I post about on like social media and stuff. So definitely check it out if you read uh, for the best and you post a review. Yeah. Um, so I love tarot cards and the spiritual side of things. My main character is pretty literal in this one. Um, but the third book, which I just finished drafting, has a lot of spiritualism, devil, God, old gods, um, you know, in a thriller. So I've definitely, that's kind of my vibe right now is probably what you're seeing with bringing in the tarot cards. Ooh, okay. Well, we are having you back for that one because that one already sounds super interesting. I can't wait. Um, Vanessa, what's your favorite movie? Well, Steel Magnolias of all time. Ah, I'm a crier. Yeah. Pink is my signature color. Oh, so ah. I love that movie. Um, and what is one thing that you want people to know about you? Uh, just that I love to connect with people, especially on social media. I mean, I'm just always on Instagram, Facebook. Um, just drop me a note. If you like swag, I've got uh, bookmarks and stickers. I love mailing stuff out. So just let me know. I'm just super easy to reach. So please connect with me because that's kind of the best part of being a writer is just connecting with people who love books. Yes, I totally agree. And we will be dropping the links um, to connect with Vanessa on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. She's got a ton of super exciting events coming out, including her book party, her book launch party tonight. And you're all invited to head over to her website um, and RSVP go. It's free. It's fabulous. She's got a ton more events coming out this month. Connect with her. She's super fun. We both love social media. So come hang out and we will see you next time here on Mighty Blaze. Thank you so much, Vanessa. So fun. You are the best host, Sarah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Day made. Thank you so much. This has been truly a joy and really illuminating. I've learned so much. So thank you so much. Thank you you for our wonderful audience. People are saying yes, yay. Um, We will see you next time. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.